Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining tonight. My name is Paula and I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the lecture committee. For those who are not familiar with us, uh, the, lecture, the lecture series is our monthly lectures run by students that aims for creating a space for critical debate and thinking in the field of design, art and architecture by bringing diverse perspectives. But most importantly, we look at how to bridge our press and the current and ongoing social discourses. Now, I would like to move on and introduce our speaker tonight, Simone Jami. Simone is an independent curator, writer, art critic, and the co-founder and editor in chef of Paris Magazine, Le Bonnoir. I hope I'm pronouncing it right, <laughs> uh, which is a publisher of magazines, books, exhibitions, etc. His practice uh, reveals a contemporary of Africa as an often objectified continent, promoting Africa origin artists and bring attention to the continent to the eyes of the world. Simone has curated and co-curated numerous exhibitions of contemporary art and photography, including the African Pivenon at the 50, uh, 52nd Biennial of Venice, the first African art fair held in December, uh, African Remix, the Divine Comedy, Senate Sen of Police, which I reckon will be mentioned later tonight. Tonight's talk surrounds, as the title suggests, uh, curating non-Western artists in the 90s and the early 21st century. How the perception at, the at that time highlighted the concepts of otherness, centrality, and authenticity. And where did we, uh, where did the West position itself throughout those changes that we witnessed? So without further ado, I'll give the floor to Simone Jami. Yes, that's me. Uh, I shall start with a confession. I would never have been interested in Africa if I had been born and raised in Africa. I sound like a paradox, but um, I think I discovered whatever one would call my Africanity when I was in Europe, where I grew up and I was born. And I discovered it by accident. Believe it or not, I'm, I'm very slow-minded. It takes time for me to understand things and to register them. I thought I was Swiss. Then I thought I was a French student, a Sorbonne. And, uh, and I guess that's the way I was perceived until one day I had this conversation with friends who were telling me about uh, the fact that nothing contemporary was coming from Africa. It is not, not really my problem. My problem was that they were talking to me as the Sorbonne guy and not as the Cameroonian that I might have seemed to be. So I didn't like the fact that they were excluding me while they were including me. Uh, so I started to ask to myself what was wrong with, with Paris. I just realized something I never realized before. I realized that there was something rotten in the kingdom of contemporary art world. I hope William Shakespeare will forgive me for this uh, boring, a bit strange boring. Um, so while you find something rotten, you have to choices. Whether you try to clean it or you let it rot. So I couldn't let it rot because I'm living in Paris and uh, I'm very sensitive to, 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 to bad smell, to bad noise, etc. So um, I decided to, to do something about it. Also for Paris, a city that I kind of like to, to be more the city I kind of liked. So it's uh, something quite strange to, to wake up one morning after this revelation and to go back to your favorite museums, to go back to your favorite places and to discover the absence of yourself. I mean, I was probably absent of those places, but I was claiming those places for being mine. I'm a fine wine drinker. I'm an expert in Bach and Mozart, etc. So this was that part of mine that I was absent of. It was the other one. 
the one of um, the people who fought the French, they lost the battle, of course, and have the right weapons. A place that uh, later on, when they were supposedly independent, put my father in jail. The place that uh, deep down in the house was still uh, organizing a technical hard discrimination. So if you bear in mind, I'm a slow thinker, slow learner. So imagine the shock, you're 23, 24, and you discover all these things and you have to absorb them. I didn't change my name into Nikita Kuntakinte to make it more African. Uh, actually, I didn't think I needed to be African. I just discovered that uh, you're not born African, you decide to become African. So it was something quite interesting. And, and this, is, this is how my young career was ruined. I was writing novels, I was seeing like the new shot, etc. And I decided to embark into this African story. And when I say Africa, it's not much about Africa, it was about the other. It's uh, ever since I've, I witnessed conversation about integration, about uh, assimilation, et cetera, et cetera. I always said very stranger to those conversations because I never wanted to be assimilated. I never wanted to assimilate anyone. I never wanted to be integrated. And if any one of you would come to Paris, I would show you Paris the way very few French people know Paris. So it was not the point. The point was that I felt lonely I felt lonely in the museums. I felt lonely in the film uh, theaters. And actually, when I recall it, I felt very alone in, in the Sorbonne. So all my thing was not about saving Africa or saving whatever. It was about saving myself and be less alone, even if I love my loneliness, my lonesomeness. That's the only place where you can really think and you can really write. But still, I needed a couple of friends who had shared a kind of experience that was mine. But bear in mind that back then, the only experience I had was I was a pretty good skier. And uh, I wrote my PhD on Boris Vian, who is a French writer, maybe some of you never heard of. So uh, to find people that were like mine was actually to find people that were questioning the notion of nationality. Uh, you know, I, I always feel sorry for people who can say I'm Dutch, just meaning I'm Dutch. I always feel sorry with French people can say I'm French, it's just meaning I'm French. Uh, like. Uh, Ma, ma Marine, Marine Le Pen, for instance, when she says I'm French, she doesn't mean anything else. I'm not even sure that she knows what to be French means that much. At least she's claiming to be French. Uh, but um, I always felt that it was interesting to always have this kind of uh, double gaze about what we are, how we perceived, and what we cannot be. And I don't believe uh, human beings can be just one thing unless they would be really poor spiritually. So I embarked into this uh, adventure. And uh, what I told to my friend was that I would bring all those uncivilized people in the best museums of contemporary art in the world. Imagine I was 25 and know what I was talking about. Um, and what I was interested in was not much to show the difference. The differences are obvious. Color skin, uh, education, social level, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I was interested to see the commonality. When we're talking about contemporary art, 
what are we talking about? Are we talking about contemporary Western art derived from what we call art history? Art history just being a Western history? Are we talking about that or are we talking about contemporary art? Are we talking about music? Are we talking about music or French music or European music? So this is, this is what I was interested in, just to complexify the debate. Bear in mind that in 91, the Venice Biennial or the Castle Documenta didn't know that there was something outside of Europe. There are very few Asian artists invited, very few Latin American invited, and no African artists invited. Um, in 91, I did a couple of things. I created this magazine, Revue Noir, that again could have been only created in Paris. Because I think you need the distance to be able to, to think. This is uh, this uh, necessary distanciation with the self that allows you to look at yourself from a distance. I'm quoting Levinas, but I'm pretending it's from me. And, um, and that distanciation allows you to be uh, what Jimmy Baldwin, James Baldwin would say, a maverick. Not belonging allows you to belong. When I went, and please don't make fun of me, when I first went to Cameroon, the first thing I told to my mom was, they're all black. And my mom told me, well, welcome to Africa. And there was no snow, etc. So I was totally destabilized. And when I go to Switzerland, I claim to be Swiss, but I know I'm not Swiss. I'm not the Swiss. I am French. I'm French, of course. I'm not the French. But the good thing is that when I'm in Cameroon, I'm Cameroonian, of course, but I'm not the Cameroonian, which allows me to look at things from those different perspectives that compose the one I am, who is a bit of this, a bit of that, probably the, the worst part uh, that aggregated where the three years where I was teaching in California, that nobody's perfect, but that is also part of who I am. So we created a Revue Noir magazine, not to claim any kind of Africanity, but just to reestablish a balance about the things we know and the things we don't. Uh, to, to explain to those people who are the great specialist of the art world, that the art world uh, was not about a given place, it was about the world, and to show them what obviously they didn't know or they were not interested in knowing. There's a, I'm going to make a little aparté. Um, I wrote for the Spiegel once a paper where they were asking me, that was those terrible events that happened in Paris. And they asked me what was my take on that. And I blame the French Republic because when you're from a poor family, when you're not properly schooled, and when you, the only image of yourself you see when you open the television is that of a killer, a thief, etc. How would you react when somebody comes to you with a long beer and call you a hero? Or you can be a hero and you can have 75 virgins when you're dead for the cause. How would you react? You're like, oh, I have a space finally. I thought I was French, but I don't see myself there. Um, yeah, uh, James Baldwin uh, told me once, if somebody would have told me that Pushkin, the Russian, that Alexandre Dumas, the French, had some African blood. The food we had on the table wouldn't have been more. The funny things wouldn't have been more. We wouldn't have more money. It would have saved my life in a, in a way you can't imagine. So I guess nobody in France told to the young Arab people that uh, uh, the chess game was invented by the Arabs, that Averroes was the first translator of Aristotle, and that geometry 
was invented there and a lot of things so nothing to be proud of so it was not about any demonstration i had a conversation with some american friends about black life matter i told them i, I kind of disagree with this slogan i think somebody would say lives matter including the black including all of them because when you're saying black lives matter it means that they might not matter and you need to claim that and that's the time i spent in philosophy classes I always want to show off that i have this kind of hegelian way of speaking but so don't don't blame me for that so i know i was just to show not to demonstrate if there is such a thing that we call contemporary art then it could be found everywhere included in africa so we went for that search of course we found things we found people who were doing and i remember this first conversation i was invited in germany to sold off i think and uh, one of the the speakers at my round table was Jan Hoot. Jan Hoot, who was then the artistic director of the Castle Documenta. And Jan said, uh, I've been to Africa, I visited all the art school, etc. I saw nothing. I was young by then and a bit, uh, not nervous, but I was a bad boy. And I think I insulted Jan Hoot. And I told him that if I would visit all the art schools in the world, I'm not sure I would find an artist. And that if the only thing he did in his three weeks in Africa, he said I went all over Africa, three weeks. If the only thing he visited was some art school, because there's something you might not know, but they're not art school everywhere in Africa. So um, he had some nice holidays. And I happened to have with me the first issue of Revue Noir magazine. Three months later, which proved that people are not born stupid, they become stupid. And when you teach them and they still have a brain, they can learn. So three months later, Jan Hood called me to ask me for the name of three artists he saw in the magazine. I invited them in the Castle Documenta. So the point is about this a story of recognition about the rottenness of the art world is that uh, the major player there is money. No money, no art, no museum, no art, no art critic, no art, no people to quote unquote recognize you or translate what you want to say, no art. It is said, for instance, that Les Magiciens de la Terre, organized by Jean Bernard Martin in, 19, in 89, was the first breakout of the, the African contemporary art. Of course, I disagreed. And Jean Bernard Martin, ever since, have been my, my best enemy or my worst friend. We get along very well because we, I remember some years ago, we were sitting on a round table. We're having a coffee and uh, we asked each other, what are we going to fight about today? I said, well, we'll improvise. There's always a subject of a comment. Well, Jean-Bert Martin did Les Magiciens de la Terre. Uh, the, there are two problems in this exhibition. Jean-Hubert wanted to show that there's magic everywhere in the world. I have no thing against that. Uh, the only thing I had against was the magic he was selecting uh, a coffin carver would become a postmodern contemporary artist a guy who would make bas relief in a voodoo temple would become an abstract uh, painter another one would become etc etc but then on the other hand the other magician were, were Naimjun Pike were Michael Barcelo were etc so I wouldn't have mind him uh, taking a, a shoemaker from Burgundy, taking a, an Apfenzelle, it's a Swiss uh, cheese uh, from Switzerland, etc., and put them with those people. Uh, but there's something, and that's where 
uh, Robert really regrets because Verbeer will lent, but Scriba remained. Uh, he wrote the idea of uh, inviting other curators who would have another kind of gaze on art than us. A curators, we try, but we found none who shared the same idea about contemporary art than us. Which is really interesting. You want to do something so-called inclusive, but then you exclude all the people who don't think like you do. So that's how things were taking place back then. And it it took very little to, to make a change because people started to call. Ralph Ellison wrote that, uh, that book. That's not my favorite book, but I love the title, Invisible Man. I think that African artists just moved from invisibility to visibility. But some people tend to think, I see some stupid people tend to think that it happened yesterday. And they didn't realize that it always happened, but we didn't know. And the problem is that what we don't know does not exist. And when I say we, I use an occidental we, because the occidental we is universal, isn't it? That's why they went all over the places to colonize and to bring civilization. So that we is the ultimate we. The same we, Hegel, who didn't only say nice things, was using when he would claim that uh, Africa haven't reached the civilization yet, the modernity. It was in 1830. It was his lesson, introductory lesson to the history of philosophy. I remember a conference I made where I created, it's known now, so I can't fake you. You probably know I created it, or you would find it out. I created a philosopher, Malian, who was teaching at uh, the University of Timbuktu in 1830. He was teaching, of course, introduction to philosophy, history of philosophy. I was saying to his student, Europe has not reached the gate of civilization. Europe has not entered history. And this is, again, my, my main thing. Uh, I was in India after September 11. I suffered. It broke my heart. And some philosophers, at least people who claim to be, there are less and less philosophers in this world, unfortunately. They started to write about the end of history. A month later, I was in Bombay with some friends who were talking about this end of history. And uh, this friend of mine said, which history is he talking about? Is he talking about a history that would include India? Or is he talking about the Western history? You would understand that my obsession, probably because as most of you, I hope, uh, because my personality was splitted, not separated, splitted, made of different layers, I could not believe in one history. My Cameroonian part, for instance, could not believe that French brought civilization when I know that they slaughtered people there. But my same Cameroonian part cannot believe that Cameroon is a democratic country where the same old man have been a president for 40 years. We still wonder if he's alive or not because one doesn't see him. And as a French, I cannot believe that it's the country of liberté, égalité, fraternité. Maybe it once were, it's not anymore. I live in a country where in the second round of the French election, presidential election, there's always the far right, a declared racist party, and they're there. And people are telling me about Voltaire, about this and that. Um, so I always tend to look at the different sides of things. And I know that there's no such a thing as history. It might be stories or histories. So this is the action I've been trying to, to translate into forms. Uh, because I, I did a festival when I was a kid, I was 
25, I think, in France. And I think it was a, a bad project because I was still young and naive. And as I told you before, I just discovered that I was African. So I made a show, a festival called Ethnic Color. And uh, I think the aim of that uh, festival was to show that we're all alike. We're all brothers and sisters. So I made a show where I selected some African artists who were the most abstract or conceptual artists. And I selected the non-African who are the more African. And there were no labels. And the game was for the visitor to say who was African, who was European, who was Latin American. And of course, they were mistaken. But I don't think a show, an exhibition is there to demonstrate. It's just there to tell a story. This is why uh, at festival, I did it. I can't say I didn't do it. And I, can say, I can't say it was a bad thing because at least I found out it was not such a good thing. I brought some Africans cook at the Espace Pierre Cardin. They messed the kitchen. Cardin told me later because they were not used to the thing, but we did fancy thing just to bring people where they're not necessarily expected. But then I gave up that part and, uh, and I decided that I would be writing stories. And um, when I, I was forced to, to make an exhibition again, I was in Spain lecturing and there was this exhibition that was the result of the Magician Latte as a guy who bought the whole magician part, African magic, and made a collection out of it. So I'm there in this museum to lecture and the title of the show was Africa Oi. I know you're all familiar with Spanish, where was Africa today? And I say, no, this can't be. And the uh, director of that museum said, well, Simon, you're always writing the thing here. Why don't you make a show? Because I found that very dangerous. In the, it was in the Canary Island for people to see a show that was entitled uh, Africa Oi and believe that this is what was produced in Africa now, and that this was what Africa was able to produce as contemporary art. It was a big lie. Uh, so unfortunately, I made a show and another one and another one. And then uh, you should not repeat it. Uh, I had a project of, um, of a show that I would curate in 2000. That would have been my last show dedicated to Africa. Because I was telling you, I was starting to feel a bit narrowed by myself, my only dealing with Africa when there's so many more things I want to deal with. So uh, this exhibition was called Africa's Time. And it was an attempt of writing a history of uh, African art. So. Uh, the time span of this show was from 1900 to 2000. The last painting was barely dry when we installed the show. And that was it. I was freed at last. I could call my friend Maurizio Catalan and uh, my friend, uh, uh, all my friends say, let's, let's make a show that won't be dealing with Africa, that would be dealing with art without any adjective. And then I'm jury in the Dakar Biennale. And I'm there with my friend David Elliott, who then was the director of the Moderna Musette in Stockholm. We're drinking, we're social drinkers. There was no COVID, so we could stay there without masks. And uh, around four in the morning, he asked me, Simon, how come we never work together? I tell him, oh, David, I see you coming. You wanted to make an African something in your museum. I shall not do that. I say, come on, let's do something. We'll have fun. And uh, finally, it was then five in the morning. I told him, I shall do a last one, but it has to be 
uber big and uber expensive. And that was the end of the conversation. And then the next day we're having a tea, we're fresher. They say, well, let's talk about the project. And as I told you, I had no project in mind. So I came back home, I said, okay, big and expensive, what could I do? I decided I would invite 100 artists from Africa. More than in Dakar Biennale, in a, a lot of Biennales. Uh, and David said, yes, how do you want to call it? And I said, I want to call it Out of Africa, which was a personal statement. He said, no, Simon, you can't do that. People are going to think of this movie, of this thing. And plus, I think the lady who wrote Out of Africa was Swedish. Uh, so I said, OK, my mistake. So uh, I decided finally to call it Africa Remix uh, because I wanted to, it was supposed to be my final statement. So I wanted to remind to everyone that there's no such a thing as an African. And there's no such a thing as authenticity. Somebody could have been born in Paris, leave, work, and die in Paris. It would not be an authentic Parisian or an authentic French. We're all remix. But it shows in some places more than in others. So if you would tell the French that it's a remix, he wouldn't realize it. He only sees it in the colonies because they brought things. But I'm in France as such is a remix of, of Rome, which is a remix of Greece, which is a remix we all all these remix. So I, I wanted to, to get rid of this notion of authenticity. That's why I call the show Remix. And again, there are some couple of blind people. The French people, they know everything about Africa. They always forget to say, they think they know everything about the French speaking Africa. They say Africa, but they know nothing about English speaking Africa, for instance, not to mention the Portuguese, etc. Not to mention even the French speaking. So there's this guy who came to me at Bobour. I say, well, Mr. Njami, you did it again. You called your show Africa Remix, and there's some Algerians, some uh, Egyptians, some Moroccans, some I said, excuse me, what's your problem? I said, this is not Africa. I said, oh, great. Have you ever looked at a map? But again, everything goes when you're outside of your own box, you're subject to preconceptions. So the best way is to anticipate them instead of suffer from them. I've never suffered from any kind of preconceptions held against me. But here, this guy who didn't know the map of Africa. For him, Africa was just down the Sahara Desert. He didn't know Egypt was part of Africa. Algeria was part of Africa. It reminds me of a show I was doing in, uh, in Austria. And we sent uh, an assistant to collect an artist who was at the airport. It took them four hours to come back to the museum. And the artist was laughing his head off, said, we're the only one remaining. So I went to her. I said, are you looking for somebody? And she felt like that. So that young girl was there to pick an African artist. The African artist was there. Uh, what she didn't know was that Kendall Gears was blonde and blue-eyed. But he was African, all right. He had this South African passport, was born and raised there. Again, preconceptions. So Remix was my attempt to say once for all that nothing is what it seems. Hegel said once, as I told you, he didn't say all these stupid things. He said that we don't know what we know, which has so many layers. We don't know what we know. Um, so I wanted to, to tell to <clears throat> those French specialists that they had no clue about what Africa was. And then there's this lady, there's also this, this kind of colonial mentality, but that is used in the art world. 
people are very proud of it. And there's this lady who came to me and said, oh, Mr. Njami, I know you discovered Elanatsui. I look at the lady, I said, excuse me? When I encountered Elanatsui, he was 20 years older than me. He'd been practicing for 40 years. He started working long before I was born. Well, if you want somebody to discover somebody, we can say L discovered me. I also have this tendency, I discovered this artist, I discovered this musician. What the hell are we discovering? Instead of having the humility uh, to face what we don't know. So they said Africa Remix was the, the answer to Le Magicien La Terre. If ever somebody tells you that, now you know. It was just a result of a long, long night where we didn't drink only water. At least then you do something about it. And there's a, another thing I told you I was a slow learner that I've um, discovered through this exhibition is that from 91, Europe started to hold a lot of discussion about African contemporary art. Ba -ba -bee, ba -ba -ba, da -da -dee, da -da -da. Uh, there were a lot of experts who found themselves experts because they did a bit of ethnography or anthropology or whatever, not necessarily art history, but they knew that the Maasai was coming from here and the Baba was coming from there. So they uh, self-proclaimed -proclaim, themselves African specialists. And those discussions were there where people were discussing what the future of African art, the market, da 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 da, -da. And one day uh, I was in Africa where I was spending a uh, great deal of time uh, talking with kids, I just realized that all those people they considered masters, they never saw their works. So for them, uh, Enanatsui or uh, Pascal Martin Tayu or Yinka Shunibari were just the same than the Picasso, the Rauschenbergs, or people they've heard on, of, people they could see through books or I don't know if internet was that efficient, but anyway, but they never seen a work that they could touch. In South Africa, they were lucky enough to have William Kentridge who was there and they had a couple of museums. So, um, so when we were discussing the tour of a remix, of course, people started to aggregate and uh, David, I love David. Um, David made a show when he was director in Stockholm. And uh, some people started to find the show very offensive. And the journalist came to him and uh, told them, uh, and you'll have to excuse what I'm going to say after I'm quoting a quote. Uh, so the journalist said, you know, the opinion uh, said that this should this show should be closed, etc. And uh, and David quoted Dirty Harry. I don't know if you know that that part of uh, Clint Eastwood before he became this filmmaker. Hey, he was Dirty Harry. So uh, they would say, as Dirty Harry say, opinion are as our souls, everybody's got one. End of quote. So the next day, I think it was a Tiger's Blatt or something, big cover, David Elliott, opinion, ah, blah, 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 so. So he left to build a museum in Japan. And he took the show with him. Uh, and of course, my friend, uh, my best enemy, or my worst friend, Jean-Bert Martin was then director at the Dusseldorf Kunstpalast. He called me and said, well, you're dealing with the Brits now, what about me? I have a museum here. Of course, my friend Alfred Pacma, who is then director of the Bobo Pompidou Center, called me as a salmon, you're betraying us, you're French, you're Parisian, you're giving the thing to her. Of course, Roger Malbert from the. And then we're all together there. And I say, guys, there's a place missing. Say, so what? We covered it all. Uh, we have uh, Japan, we have Sweden, we have this. I say, Africa. The show must go to Africa. Of course, the questions were, 
well, do they have a museum that could host da 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 da? I said, guys, the show must go to Africa. So they paid for the show to go to Africa, it went to South Africa. And it was, uh, I guess, the, the most moving moment there because uh, journals, people are so crazy, were writing, Africa remix comes back home. But I would tell them it's not home here. You're not totally Africa, uh, all these kind of things. But then people could see, some Africans could see and touch. I shouldn't say touch because when you're a museum, one of the rules is don't touch. Uh, could touch the thing, could, could feel the thing. And I know you're all a fine art specialist, but uh, my first shock was when my parents brought me to the MoMA and I saw uh, a Demoiselle d'Avignon in real. I would say in book, I thought it was just a tiny little thing like that. And I saw this thing, you could see the matter, you could see the paint, you could, you could feel uh, what was there, what was behind it. So they could feel that and they could feel some pride in a way. Of course, nobody should ever feel proud for somebody else's work. At least they were like, they made it. I was telling them, it's not about they made it. I hate inclusion. Uh, uh, they should make it here. And this is one of the reasons, as you understood, I'm very fond of the market and the money and the business. But still, I uh, participated in the creation of the first art fair in Africa. And the idea was very simple. Since the market is ruling it all, let's have African purchase, African works before it goes away, or before it becomes too expensive or before whatever. Because I, I hate people, the, the, the professional complainers. You know, I have people who are telling me uh, because he didn't succeed at school, he would say, is the colonization. Some people would say, it's slavery. So I say, come on, give me a break. It's, it's now, it's today. Um, so what I was telling them when we opened um, the fair was that you can always complain saying all your masterpieces are held in Occidental Western museums. But the day after tomorrow, when your grand grandson will have to pay a, a ticket to go and see Elanatsui, Inca Shunibari, et cetera, et cetera, because they will all be held in modern art museum in the West. Then you'll have nobody to blame but yourself. So this is why uh, <clears throat> my work shifted. I started to do a lot of workshops in Africa, a lot of strange things analysis in order for Africa to have the tools to stand for itself and not to, I'm going to use this, this word after all, it's the title of the conversation, and not to be forced into this narrow door that would not allow them to enter widely, but maybe one by one or 10 by 10, but to create their own discourse, to create their own uh, set of analysis to create their own discourse. Because if you don't have a discourse, you don't exist. If you're not able to define yourself, there will always be some good spirits to define you. So this is what I've been busy now, trying to create uh, platforms where things can happen there. And when people are not dreaming of the other side, thinking that if you come to Paris or to New York, your life is going to be easy. I mean, I have a lot of French artist friends who moved to New York or to London because they thought their life would be easy. They moved back. So when we're talking about inclusion, when you talk about social changes, who's talking? It's always the same people who are 
using this discourse. And I'd rather have them having this type of discourse, but that of Marine Le Pen. But uh, it's, a, it's a self problem, I would say. Again, James Baldwin told me he discovered it was black when he went out of Harlem, because being black in Harlem was nothing. Everybody was a human being, only going out. So I think that is inclusion, exclusion is, is tricky because it's a problem that the Western societies have to deal with. It's not my problem. I mean, in Africa, they don't deal with inclusion of exclusions. I think it's just uh, the West discovering the aftermath of history, uh, trying to find a way to, uh, to live with, with everyone, to live without having the fear of, of losing their souls. But the discourse when they held in Europe are just inner discourses where the other doesn't matter that much. It's about us. How are we going to manage to live better where we live? It's not much about how are we going to accommodate the other. It's how are we going to accommodate ourselves with the other. I'm working on a project in the Caribbean. That's where I've been there a few times. And the title is Abolitions with an S. Of course, when I went there, I said, oh, great, this theme, yeah, because slavery. So I'm sorry, it has nothing to do with slavery. And I told them that the, the abolition I was the most sensitive, because I witnessed it, was when uh, the French government, socialist, declared the abolition of the death penalty. So I told them I'm more sensitive to the death penalty abolished in France because I was there. Is abolition of slavery? I don't really know. But then what matters in the abolition? They're celebrating the abolition of slavery, but who is celebrating it? France. But who created it? France. So the guilty is also the, the freer, in a way, which is a very cynical way of look at things. Because to abolish or to think about inclusion, you need to think that you're in a position of including. But if you think of including, it probably means that you've been excluding. It means that you're trying to, to put a band aid on something that maybe is growing bigger than what you could handle. But here we go back to, to the abolition, is that the abolition never abolishes the subject that is supposed to be abolished. It's not because we say, we declare that this is abolished, that the this is really abolished. Abolition is just a declaration. It takes much more time and much more reflection and much more work to abolish things than just to sign a decree. It takes much more time to, to include and to have discussions. Uh, I was having this discussion because I, I was offered a couple of jobs by the, the actual French government that of course I politely declined. And uh, one of the conversations I have is, is a lady there say, yeah, we, we, we're doing, we're changing. And I ask her how many recognizable faces are sitting on your government? I want people to feel included, but there's not a single face in your government who would remind them that they're included. So exclusion, inclusion, social changes uh, should not be left into the scholars' hands. Unfortunately, it is left into the scholars' hands. 
I think it has to do with economy. It has to do with politics. It has to do with everything. At times, I was once a scholar, and it was so funny because we thought that through our seminars and through our things, we're changing the world. And I felt slightly guilty when I created this, this art fair, because I was like, art is not about money and business, it's about creation. Is it really? I mean, what we call art, the recognition of an artist, is it only due to his talent? Elanatsui was worth uh, 10,000 pounds at the first stage of Africa Remix. When we finished, it was 300,000 pounds. And now if you don't have a couple of millions, forget about it. But then what does Ellen Atsui? I curated uh, two Biennales in Dakar. And one day the five kids came to me and said, Mr. Njami, we need to talk to you. I was about to tell them to go and see elsewhere if they could find me. And then they said, we were sent by Professor Anatsui. Clink, say, oh, what? Well, sorry, I'm a hard, hard boy, but at times I must admit that I may be slightly moved. Uh, Ellen Anatsui paid their trip, their stay, their food, because he found essential for them to attend that Biennale. And it was founding uh, BC Silver's uh, uh, art center, the same way Yinkesha Nibari has built in Lagos, where he's originally from. He's built uh, a residency center, et cetera, et cetera. So the flow goes. So I think that the people who are integrating and doing the most for integration are not those who are supposed to be the integrators. There's those who are integrated. I think that if uh, Yinka was made an MBA by my good friend, Queen Elizabeth, it was not because she wanted to make a Nigerian an MBA. It was because all of a sudden, uh, Yinka was one of the most talented or expensive British artists. So, he could be integrated, of course. This is how it works for the moment. So uh, uh, Yinka was not integrated by Lisbeth, even if Lisbeth gave her, her his uh, member of British Empire title. He was integrated by himself. And I think that if we really want to deal with integration, et cetera, et cetera, we should give to people the means to do the job and not to try to do the job for them. That's why I stopped being a teacher. That's why I never claimed to be a curator. And that's why I discovered no one. And as a conclusion, um, as you understood, I was a promising uh, young novelist. I haven't written a novel for the past 30 years, what he told me. I was a promising lawyer. I think I've stood in a court for one year. And then I started this nun job. I thought I would do it for a minute and uh, I'm still doing it in a way. But then when I would be asked, because I asked some of you earlier, why are you doing this? Uh, the, the best answer I've found so far was for myself so that I would have this balance of the three or four or five parts of me and that no place in the world would be stranger to me and that I would feel better in a place where I live when they're showing African, Asian, Latin American artists than if they were not as it used to be. So actually I did that for what? To make the place where I live better. And not better as somebody wants to save the world, just better for myself. 
I can go to museum and find people. When we did a remix in, in Paris, uh, Alfred Pacma was amazed. He told me to make a demonstration, never seen, this is not how he said it, he's a politically correct person, a very well uh, educated, but I'm just translating, he said, I've never seen this amount of Arabs and, and Negroes in this museum. I said, of course, what do you do for them? What do you offer them? Some people just came there knowing nothing about art or whatever, because they heard that there was an Algerian artist in this place that they never understood because it's a funky architecture. And it was a place that they would detour instead of enter. And they would enter just because there was an Algerian there and the Senegalese would come to the show and say, excuse me, where is the Senegalese artist? And of course, while visiting the show, they were forced to see other, other artists, but this is, this is how we do, concretely, uh, in Handoven. What was the last show presenting some non-European artists in your best museum? It's a rhetorical question. I'm not asking for an answer, but you think about it and you'll see that uh, solutions are there. But again, Baldwin, well, I, I wrote a biography in Baldwin, but <clears throat> I'm trying to sell it, but it's out of print. So, uh, I'm not selling it, but he, he said so many interesting things. Uh, he said once to, to live a better life as a ticket and a ticket as a price. And he concluded by saying, I don't know if we will be ever able to pay the price of the ticket. I think most of the time we ask asking ourselves wrong questions. We want to be nice people. We want to, to be good, we want to be welcoming. We're not trying to be efficient. This is the end of it. It's uh, eight two. Trying to stick to the timing. Yes, but yeah, that's a great, that's a very generous sharing. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a, I would say warming. Uh, it has been very warming and, and beautiful at the same time. Um, should we open up for, for questions right now? I don't know what was the timing. It's good. It's, uh, huh. it's good. You know, I'm a bit Swiss. So. <laughs> I've noticed. <laughs> um, so for the questions, please turn on the camera for them um, to ask the questions yourself or drop a message. But um, we do prefer face-to-face -face interactions as much as we can at this time. Maybe I can start with my question first before people have a bit of time to digest as well. Um, <laughs> So I, I don't know, I hope I don't get rude on the first question, but I did notice on the words that you use um, a lot of Africa or African. And I was thinking that, um, because I think people are starting to be, uh, you instead of using Africa as a continent, as a, as a itself, to be, to use the words as the nation, the national, the nation's names, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, instead of really just seeing Africa as Africa. And I was wondering, is there a reason that you keep using Africa even in, I notice even in single person as well? Well, I do it because I don't know you and I didn't want to be rude and to mention countries you've never heard of. Uh, the policy of uh, Ovinois was precisely to treat um, the artist country by country. Hmm. The title of those issues are countries, and I'm very uh, uh, fond of countries. The only country I've mentioned, or two maybe, were Senegal and Cameroon. Senegal because of the Biennale and Cameroon because of, of me. That was to make a long story short, because I didn't want to, if I would say Ghana, then I'd have to go into some Ghanaian stories that might be specific, et cetera, if I say South Africa. I would, would lecture on South Africa. So it was just uh, this abstraction uh, that is Africa that I use. I use the abstraction of it more an idea than, than a fact. So 
this is to make our life less complicated. This is why I use the term Africa. Hmm. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, if anyone has any question. Yeah, I have a question, Simon. Do you think that this, this trend towards inclusion and diversion in, in the art world and also in the design world is something that's long lasting or more of a hype? Well, uh, the point again, when people were talking about discovery and uh, inclusion, we're talking about uh, art, I, I would tell them you did nothing. We did the job and it's gonna last if uh, some people did the job. Again, I don't know a place who is expecting anyone uh, as a king. I know people who have been working. I'm giving you the example of Al because he's my hero. He had been doing his craft for 40 years. He didn't care about anything. He was teaching in Sukha, he was doing his things. All of a sudden, the world acclaims him doesn't give it them. He takes the money, he uses for something else. It's because he's been working. Uh, one day, my dear friend, Santu Mufokeng, South African photographer who passed away, we're in Castle and two ladies, charming, Gucci and so on, are walking towards us. One of them says loud, uh, oh, let me introduce you to this beautiful South African photographer I discovered last year. And Santu, who did not go green, that was a, a game, uh, a quote from Fela Kuti, if you call a woman African woman, no go green. Uh, Santu didn't go green. And when they, they were close to our table, he told me, Simon, you see those three bitches? They said they discovered me. And I don't know why they didn't join us at our, at our table. So, Things are just a matter of perspective. If we still look at things from one uh, direction in a one dimensional way, we might be tempted to think that things that we don't know don't exist, that people are not working. If the market we're looking at, or if the fanciness or the museum we're looking at, if there's no design, etc., we might be tempted to believe that. There is no design. It's up to us to go and look. But things will come in due time. But again, something we should stop thinking is that this is the center. There are so many centers, but we're often trapped by the place where we're living. And we're trapped by the fact that we, we have only that perspective of what is surrounding us. Again, me talking, uh, what made me do my things uh, was the surrounding. I was not happy with the way Paris looked like. So I went to look for things to bring a bit of life to, to Paris. So it's happening. I know a couple of, uh, of designers who are asked to do things outside of the continent, in this specific case outside of Mali. Uh, but uh, there's a market, there's an offer. That's why the market, I think, is, uh, is important. I wouldn't have said that 20 years ago, but I was naive. Offer, sales. That's what makes the market. That's what makes the quotation of things. And of course, things that are not seen have no reason to enter the market. But when uh, you hear about one uh, designer coming from the continent, you may be sure that there's another one not that far and another one not that far and that things might change. Because if this guy is selling a guy from Africa and works, I would see his neighbor, his competitor, looking for some stuff coming from Africa. 
not necessarily, and we don't care about, not necessarily for the goodness of his heart, but for the goodness of his uh, pocket. Thank you. Anyone else? Even just drop a comment, yeah. if I'm cool. I want to say, can you hear me or? Yeah. Yes. Um, first of all, thanks so much for the words. Uh, for somebody who is working on this side of the world, one goes through like a similar process of feeling like, do I belong? Do I not belong? And how how is one supposed to work when you feel like you have no ground upon which you stand on? You know how how did you how did you solve this? Or did because you uh, mentioned it in the beginning. Well, first of all, I've never met any human being without any ground to stand on. And I guess you mean a metaphorical one. Uh, yeah. Well, you have to claim your space. I am where I live. But then the I that live there is a multiplicity. I don't have to look like I have to be. And when I'm somewhere, I have to claim that space with uh, all the tools that I have. Now, um, memory is another strong ground. Uh, education is another strong ground. Uh, when I was a kid, my, my parents decided to send me to Cameroon to my uh, grandfather's God. And my grandfather's mission was to speak no German, no French, no English, no whatever, but Bassa, which is one of the 258 languages spoken in Cameroon. So these kind of things help. Uh, the fact that my father was put in jail reminds me uh, how grand, grounded I am. The fact that my grandfather fought the French reminds me what I am. It, it's all about memory and about uh, occupying, not Wall Street, but your space. Nobody can deprive you from your space, but you. So you have to decide what is your space, despite all the odds. You know, there's something about those uh, liberation movements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, they were born out of distanciation, the negritude, all the freedom liberations, uh, when Kuma uh, did his things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera but because they were somewhere else. So they could see from afar. And there's a, a term that uh, Césaire used. He said the miraculous weapons. When you go to some places in Africa, like back to the colonial times, if you're in Cameroon, you have to speak a proper French. If you're in Maputo, you have to speak a proper Portuguese to escalate the social levels. So I just see it a, a very, a very terrible uh, uh, psychological situation where you're still cherishing something that you don't master and you're still looking at the social or the knowledge or whatever levels outside of yourself. So you're the stranger to your own development. This is why the, the language is important. This is why uh, the love for oneself is important. This is why memories are important. And did you have like um, anyone to share your memories with? Or were you, is there, what do you think about like intellectual isolation when it comes to the memory in a way? Well, the memory is per se an intellectual isolation in itself. 
uh, what you can share about it are just bits. And I have found plenty of people to share some selected memories. When I'm with this guy, we talk about this white wine that is not that good, but that you find in the mountain near the Servin. When I'm this, with this other guy, we talk about this way they would cook the, 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 the beans with this meat, da, da, da. When I was this other guy, so uh, there's always somebody with whom one can share some memory. And you can never share the whole of it with one person, starting with yourself, because memory tends to fade. We have to reinvent it every now and then, no matter if it's right or not, as long as it's functioning. I do have a question. Uh, first, I'm going to start with uh, just um, kind of a quote you mentioned during um, an interview that I think just quite beautiful words that is um, Africa is the most contemporary com uh, continent. So it uh, led me like, uh, maybe it's the reason you started working around contemporary art. And I'm wondering like, would you have been interested also to go more in the past, like for example, modern art or slightly more yeah, back in the days, like maybe to find back forgotten names or yeah, things that uh, deserve to be highlighted or to pay tribute to past names? This, this is not my job. It's not your job. I'm living here and now. I'm not interested in going to dig uh, the caves and stuff like that. Some, some guys can do that. I'm, I'm not an ethnographer. I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not a, an archaeologist. Uh, and I'm not that interested anyway. I'm interested in what's happening here now. And maybe that might allow me to understand what happened yesterday. But I tend to look at things from, from the here. Because uh, Merleau Ponty wrote, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to translate it quick. He said, the present is a former future and a future past. The past is an old present. Etc. He plays with the future. The here is 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 really what matters. That's why this discussion on uh, the French uh, things in the civilization French Museum should I restitute or should I not? I'm not that interested because while Macron was saying, I'm going to restitute stuff, the, the university rights for the strangers, non-European, that included Africans, doubled. So if I would love Africa, <laughs> instead of making all this blah, blah, about restitution, I would make sure the kids from the continent who want to come here, will be able to, to pay the fees that are outrageous fees that are asked to them. But again, there's always a, a great strategy. I don't know if you play chess or if you play poker. Anyway, any magician, so-called magician, will always make sure your attention is focused elsewhere. So if ever you look at Trika, don't look at the hand doing things because the hand you don't see is the one actually working. Unfortunately, we tend to look at the hand that is agitated. I've seen so many stupid writings and reaction on this restitution thing. And most of the people who are writing don't even know what they're talking about. And they're talking about, yes, our spirit, our blah, blah, blah. So how did they do? So I want to tell me that they walking dead because since their soul was taken from them their memories were taken they're walking dead now we have to have to be serious and hard when we when we think 
but feel free to excavate the, the old stuff and give name to those who deserve to have a name. I want to make sure that those who are alive have a name that is well known by everyone. Anyone has another question? Comment? Suggestion? I have something a little bit more lighthearted, and that is like about your book. Remember this? The African Gigolo? Yeah, so I, wrote, I wrote it. So I yeah, guess. And, uh, and the thing is, I looked for this in English and I can't find it anywhere. So I've never managed to read this other with an <laughs> app on my telephone, which translates by. Oh, my over. Oh. So it's like a sculpture so in my house so. that I really want to know happens inside this book. Is there a copy in English? And if not, please tell me at least a little bit of what it is about. Well, there, there's no copy <laughs> in English and uh, I'm going to make a very long story short. Yeah. One day, excuse my French. I'm using it since I know it can't read it. Uh, one day I was really pissed. It was in the mid of uh, the 80s by what they call the African wave. Well, yeah. Where I would see all those guys having good time and using those weapons of their Africanity, of their blackness, of racism to, to have a, an easier life. So I decided to call them the, the gigolos. The people who would be in a, passing their masters, they haven't worked, they haven't done anything. And the teacher say, you're not good. And they would say, you colonize me and here again, you know. Uh, this is what Jean-Paul Sartre called la mauvaise foi, bad faith. So I was really sick of that because I mean, I was told to be a shooter, but nobody can say that I did not shoot in every direction. So that book was to shoot a couple of people who were pissing me off. To tell you a, a nice story, uh, I'm in a nightclub back then, in the club with friends. Back then, I was still not an African, so. My university friends happen all to be Caucasians. This is how they say it. And with them, there's this guy, and there's even this moment where they would wear kinta clothes and pretend they play djembe. Well, some were playing djembe, but you didn't see them playing djembe everywhere. And the guy called me like four in the morning, we're exhausted, and he asked to, to my friend girl to dance. And she said, I'm exhausted. I can't anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I said, OK, you're racist. And she stood. I couldn't believe that. I was sitting there right beside her. And later I said, how conditioned you are. He just needed to say you're racist for you to, to stand like a puppet when you had so many elements. You just had to show me. I said, oh, really? Yes, I am. I'll do something. But no, there's guilt at her stand. And those people were playing with, uh, it's written in that book, there's a white men and mostly white female guilt. So they're not gigolo in the sense that they're paid to perform certain sexual adventures. They're gigolo in the sense that they're, they're making people pay for, for things they have not necessarily suffered and uh, just for to reach a, a goal. We have a those cheaters, we find them everywhere. Not only on that continent. I've seen a lot of them in Latin America or even in the United States of America or in Europe. Voila. Now you may have the feeling that you've read the book, but what saved the main character is the memory of his father.
It's lovely to hear you, but you're mute. So oh, no, can... I'm just looking at I'm just looking at it and oh. being like I thought you were talking. Oh yeah, as in like it it's a, it's an interesting thing that it's about the the memory of somebody that saves a character like this. It's false. It's just a, a profound. It's just um, nice to know. I will eventually read it at some point, <laughs> which is, gets better. I don't know when. And it's not in German, is it? No. <laughs> okay. Just checking. <laughs> You've checked? Yeah, I've checked. Yeah. You have your answer. You said just checking. You've checked. I said no. So it's good. Okay. You don't have to excuse yourself for checking. No. One last uh, burning question. I'll make it burn, please. <laughs> uh, hi, I have a question. So um, you've spoken a lot about the market and, and money and business. And my question is, how does art and creation work in hand with that for example is art about creation or about business and can it be both and how would um, one draw the line or bridge the gap between both i i don't think that they work hand in hand this is how you have a go between passes by l doesn't care about the price of his works some people handle that but uh, when we're working on Remix, I'm in Johannesburg and uh, my friend Clive Kellner told me I try to get some money from the banks, et cetera, and nobody's interested. I said, manage a meeting with them. So we had another meeting and, uh, and they wrote a check, not a very big one, but a consequent check. And I did not talk about art with them. I hate wasting my energy, I'm lazy. But I told them something I've noticed. They would always write Johannesburg, a world-class city. And I just rapped on the world-class. I said, I'm offering you a world-class exhibition. Your name is going to be ranked between London, Paris, Tokyo, blah, blah, blah. That's how they paid. But when Clive went, he told them about the artist. So then there's some beautiful artists that would have done this. And the banker was like, ah, I'd rather pay for a football game. Uh, so uh, I distrust an artist who can talk about uh, the value of his work. But yeah, this is why galleries are making money. This is why a lot of people are making money. But again, I don't believe in the artists who would be happy to be poor and unknown. I think this kind of romanticism is long gone. Even Van Gogh was not happy to be unknown and to, be, to have only one collector, his brother. But some would kill for that. They're just a fine balance. Uh, I, I don't really like uh, this guy who used to be a banker, was working at the stock exchange or something. This American who's worth millions, I was told. I don't like him. He's too cynical. He's too... I mean, even to make his name great, he married a, a woman who used to work as a prostitute, but who became a member of the Italian parliament. I mean, you see people like Al, he doesn't talk. Oh, an anecdote. We're in Spain mounting a show, and L only speaks English. And some uh, technician comes to me and say, Simon, please, the old man is going to kill us. Old man, boom, L. I come there and see L sitting in his chair, and the people are doing the lights, are moving the lights, and L say, No, no, no. And I arrive and and El has a smile and say, Simon, I'm trying to explain to them that the reflection I want 
in that of the sun on the, the tin roofs in Lagos. So, okay, we did the job, but how could the light technicians make that light? And they don't know about you know, the sun over the tin roofs in, in Lagos. But this is the only thing El was busy with. And actually he decided not to take interview anymore if people are not qualified. Because at the beginning people were asking, oh, recuperation, Africa. Da, da. He called me and said, Simon, nobody speak about my work. <laughs> I'm tired wasting this time. So they speak with my gallery or whatever, but not with me. And um, and talking about the work is is something that doesn't stand noise. All the artists I know we speak about, we dare, I dare speak about their work when we're together, one to one, and then and we talk, and I would hear them saying some different things, and when they're outside as a protection. But art is sacred. That's why the silence of the studio is so important. Without it, you could not stand the noise of the fairs. The studio is there and you, you get a regeneration you know, with yourself. I'm happy, uh, personally, I don't want to offend anyone, but uh, COVID, uh, told me that I had a place and I had a couple of books that I wanted to reread instead of being on a plane four times a month. This kind of thing we, we all need every now and then to remember why we're doing what we're doing. But don't hate money, just hate the way it's used. Would be very sad if I could not buy the champagne I like. Thank you. One last question. <laughs> uh, and, uh, we, we'll do it like they do. No, it was just because of this joke. Uh, I attended a wedding once, and the, the priest is always say, if somebody has something to say, he should say it now or remain silent forever. And then they would marry the thing and they just <laughs> right. Yeah. So. Okay, I guess we'll remain silent for now. Or maybe Fernand wants to hey, Timo. say something. Uh, for you. Yeah, just to, to say hey and uh, also. I was thinking maybe you could talk a bit about Revue Noir because I don't know a lot about it. I want to be to know a bit more about um, the story of how does it started and um, and like what kind of strategy uh, was it to put light on some. I think uh, a lot of uh, photographers from Africa. Wow, well, the excellent strategy of Revue Noir was no strategy. We knew nothing about magazines. I mean, the only thing I knew about magazine was what I was writing when I was a student. Um, my friends are architects. I am a, used to be a lawyer, a professor, and a, a, a literature specialist, uh, whatever. So we had no clue. We just said, we need to, to do this to show what we know to, to the world, but it was about us. And this is something important. I think if we would have had any strategy, I don't know, maybe it would have lasted three months, but we had none. And uh, it so happened that some other people than us felt the need that we felt. So uh, we had uh, one philosophy we are going to get away from the Beaux-Arts, this very Western division of the arts, music, dance, theater, architecture, painting, 
I said, everything is in everything. And um, photography, because again, it was something people are pretending did not exist in, in Africa. Ravino started before uh, photography biennial was created in, in Bamako, Mali in 94. So yeah, we, we just basically wanted to, to have fun. Personally, I wanted to, to know Africa more because we would go in every each and every country, discuss with people, uh, spend time in the studios, uh, find who were the writers, because we would always ask a local writer to write in the magazine. And would also try to break all those uh, divisions. The language was one, but when we would make an issue in Mozambique, we would add Portuguese because I cannot ask a writer to, to write in another language than the one he possessed. And it was country by country. And we didn't want to make any critique. We were not into saying this is good, this is bad. But the smart people could notice that some people would have four full pages and some people would have a little stamp and some people nothing. Uh, so basically that was the, the thing. So that we, we did an issue on cuisine. I gave recipes, etc. We We did all kind of, uh, of things because we thought that uh, that creation could not be splitted into parts. If you look at contemporary art today, people will play with music, with blah, blah, blah. There's no such a thing that I want to enter that because it's not. So we, we the main thing was to break the, the disciplinary boundaries and to show Africa country by country and not as, uh, as if the continent was a country. So that's why we went to Lagos, we went to Nairobi, we went to Douala, we went to, and, and we started again because we didn't want people to think that it was about Africa. It was just about African artists, not about Africa. So the first issue, uh, the city was London. As people might have expected that way, our first city is uh, Abidjan, whatever. The first city was London. And the first interview I did there was with Michel Tournier, who was a French writer, just to mix things into, well, basically to be where you're not, you're not expected. But we just did a, a book, we thought it deserved a celebration. I published a book that is called Revenoir History and Stories. That tells, uh, okay. it's a fat book. We, we love fat books. Then how, how did you, because you said you encountered a lot of African um, photographers, but how, how did you find them finally, like before going to these countries? What kind of? I don't find them. There are plenty of uh, Africans who are photographing in Paris. But I remember when we started uh, to look for it, uh, I would go to a place and ask, do you know any photographer, old photographer? They would say no. Now, of course, on the buffet or on some place, I would see a photograph of the grandfather. I would say, well, what is this? And I would say, this is my grandfather. I said, yes, but somebody took the image. Why the photograph was not perceived as a photograph, but as the person who was represented there. And this is how we found out that, of course, there were studios all over Africa from the 50s before taking photographs. There were even some reporters in the 30s, etc. And the, the principle for me is that what exists somewhere cannot not exist somewhere else. 
Uh, Europe should not think that they have the monopoly of racism. I think they know that. Racism, you find it everywhere. Uh, thanks God, you find love everywhere too. Ugliness everywhere, but beauty as well, everywhere, and so on and so forth. So they should have been photographers in Africa, and, and they were. Thank you. I think we'll wrap it up here. I think I Eva wanted to add one little thing about sure. the ground. And then we finish with Eva. Well, you will conclude after as the master of ceremony. So Eva, put your mic on. Your hand, your hand yeah. is up, but put your, okay, listening. Yeah, I'm listening. Oh, no, I never. Oh, you I raised just, your hand, so I thought you, okay. I was reacting uh, to some, to what uh, Fernand asked. So, but no, I don't have, I just want to say thank you for the wonderful talk. It's really encouraging and very profound. And I'll pass it back on to the AE lectures. <laughs> cool, Alice. <laughs> Maybe it's the last question, but it's the a last bit one, <laughs> like it's the I've last been hesitating to ask you, but I'm very curious, like someone established like you, would you mind to share like uh, a kind of mistake you have made in, 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 in your journey that you have learned something and it's like, because it's always nice to see what fail and then what we can learn, maybe you can share a bit on that. Well, I told you about the first one, maybe you were not there is to make a festival, a big festival, exhausting festival, in order to make the world better. Understood that that was not a, that is not the reason I'm there. Because then, you know, you start with a failure and you know that your life is gonna be a failure because you will never make the world better. But then, um, mistakes, well, I, at the beginning, I was insulting a lot of people uh, I don't know, you, you make mistakes. Uh, I was not trained as a curator. So the first discovery I made was that uh, uh, you have to deal with the space and that some spaces you cannot just submit to your will. There's always a dialogue. If a space doesn't want this, don't force it. Start to talk to him and to tell you something. Um, what else? I, I was, I, I was, I think, I was taking things, and I was young. I was taking things seriously. And uh, growing up, I, I had a distance. Instead of killing people, I started to try to teach them. And I was killing them. You say something I don't like. You're dead. And I love to do that on platforms. I wait for you, there's this press conference, 100 people, you're there, Shlack! I kill you. And I didn't realize people would, would remember that. So it was just a funny joke. <laughs> so people are taking things far too seriously. Um, but there are things you can you, you can laugh about everything, not with everyone. There's something I've learned. But basically, you don't make mistakes when you're starting. And you don't make mistakes when you have reached whatever level I've reached, because mistakes are part of the program. They just change. You know, Mishima, Yukio Mishima, you're all familiar with, Japanese writer, I was asked one day, uh, have you ever thought you wrote the perfect book? He said, hell no. I would have killed myself because the only thing I'm interested in is writing. So I had a nightmare to write the perfect book for a writer. Anyway, he killed himself, but it was for other reasons. He tried to push the king because he thought the king of Japan was not following the samurai traditional rules. Dance with your mistakes. Somebody who don't make mistakes is whether God, and we know God is dead. 
whether the devil, and we know the devil is a reflection of God. So everybody makes mistakes. Just don't make the same twice. Thank you. I almost feel like this is more of a light coaching session than a DA lecture. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Simon. Thank you all for joining tonight and sticking around. Um, it has been very insightful. Thank you for the insightful words as well. Uh, it has been a great night. And I hope to see you soon. And have a good night, everyone. Good night. I mean, you're young and you're talking about good night. I mean, the night is starting. <laughs> okay, take it easy. Thank you. And for those who drink, have one for me. Thank <laughs> you.